So, where have I been for the best past of the last month? Yeah, where well, I've really not had a chance to put up videos on this channel at all. And it's because I was two experiments. Um, really quite involved experiments that, you know, require quite a lot of focus. So you don't get a lot of time to do other stuff whilst you're there. And the two experiments, one was the neutron reactor in France. Uh, this place, LLB. And the other one... Uh, so this was in Paris, and then straight from Paris to Bessie, which is a Berlin synchrotron. Uh, so this deals with x-rays, uh, the first experiment with neutrons. Um, and it's at a reactor at LLB, which is, this was actually its last cycle. It's been quite sad in many ways. Um, that it's, it's entirely a French-run dealie, or, or was, but the uranium that it requires... <laughs> It basically burns weapons-grade uranium, which is quite rare. And the reason you do that is because you want lots of neutrons. Um, and that uranium is actually quite expensive to get a hold of. Uh, so they were ramping back um, the uh, whatever. And, and the, they basically said, we're not buying any more cores to burn in this thing. And so when we run, when we run out of cores, that's it. The reactor is done. And they start, you know, this sort of fairly long process of um, decommissioning. Now, it turns out this was an old reactor at LLB. Um, I, I don't know exactly how old, certainly older than I am. Um, and there are next generation reactors that produce much more flux. Um, but it turns out the instruments that we're interested in, you've got actually about half the flux on this really old machine, on this really old reactor, because you can get closer to the core, of course. You know, it's like a light bulb, essentially. The closer you get to it, uh, the more intense the light. And so for the sort of experiments that we were doing, eh, this was sort of fairly comparable in terms of neutron flux to the, the next generation reactors. Um, however, uh, uh, They'd actually upgrade, right? The, how good a uh, measurement you get depends on two things. How bright your neutron source is and how good your detectors are. So if you've got a really bright source but a really crappy detectors, it's still not really a very good machine. Anyway, um, in their wisdom, uh, LLB had actually upgraded their detectors. Um, <clears throat> so it's that they were actually better than the sort of next generation machines, but they hadn't really told anyone about it. So this machine had basically been sitting there not doing an awful lot. Well, people were using it, but um, <clears throat> it was by pure chance that I actually found out that this machine had been upgraded like a few years ago. It was just doing a favor for someone, right? Yeah, they wanted something done, you know, some measurements done, which I thought mostly a waste of time, but whatever, you know. I thought, hell, I'll, I'll go and try and measure the impossible for them. And it turns out this machine was so bloody fantastic that it actually worked. Um, and after that, we'd been trying to use this machine as much as possible. Uh, you, and we were really on a time schedule then because we found out that they were shutting the reactor down. And this was the last cycle of the machine. So when we, we really did sort of wave goodbye to it for the last time, uh, this time. So basically, the way it works is a, a diffractometer. So your your reactor's here, actually fairly close, and so you've got uh, a hot source somewhere, and and you've got yeah, the hot source gives off a black body of of neutrons, which then hit a crystal, which it splits basically like a a prism, and so various energies come off in various directions, and you shine those onto your sample source which then diffracts them, uh, you know, the monochromatic neutrons, which is then um, a way of measuring the actual structure of your sample here. And <clears throat> um, what, what you get is something very much like this. Um, let's get up back there. So th this is basically angle on the diffractometer, and if you're measuring liquids, you get something like that. And you do a Fourier transform of that, you get something that is a measure of the structure of the solutions. Um, then, yeah, can, well, the system that we're interested in studying in this case was phospholipids. Um, now, 
it's one of the most annoying things about trying to study life is <laughs> some huge amount of life actually depends on these things, cell membranes. And it, if, it's obvious when you think about it that, you know, we're about, what, two meters tall, 100 odd kilos, that sort of thing. But we're actually made up of cells that are minuscule. And the reason that that's important is those minuscule cells have quite a lot of surface area to them. And those surface areas are absolutely covered with all sorts of things that make life possible. Right. This is why, you know, fundamentally the, 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 the workings of what goes on in bacteria and in your cells is actually pretty similar. You know, it's more or less the same uh, cell membranes with lots of proteins in that do stuff. And that's really important for life. Um, and it's kind of annoying that, you know, even, um, even when you look these up, they have such crap. I mean, we live in a, a, the time where you can do molecular dynamic simulations, of these things that are pretty accurate, but, you know, we still have these cartoony representations of what cell membranes look like, um. Uh, Anyway, so the critical thing that we're after is these bits called head groups. Yeah, there's a sort of bit that likes water and there's a bit that doesn't like water. So they make these bilayers, which are the stable structures, cell membranes. Um, but the head group here is a is, is a pretty reasonable approximation. Let's see if we can find a nice picture of it. Uh, God, no. Why are they all so terrible? Anyway, uh, yeah, it, it's essentially a, a tetramethyl ammonium group and a phosphate group. And if you want to do molecular dynamic simulations of these things, which are essentially are, um, you assume that Newtonian mechanics applies at an atomistic level, which, you know, you basically ignore all the quantum mechanical stuff, which it turns out is actually a fairly decent approximation. But you need some data to parameterize whether you're getting it right or not. You need some measure of the structure at that sort of uh, length scale. And so we were basically doing uh, measurements on uh, dimethyl phosphate and tetramethyl ammonium. And so seeing what the interactions between these various groups are, just as a sort of a, a test bed to see, see how accurate the, the simulations could get these things. You need the experimental data at some point. Um, and I've not got around to analyzing it yet because the experiments are brutal, um, right? You you have to make up the solutions and the solutions have to be uh, chemically identical but vary in isotopic concentrations of just one nucleus. Uh, they are very challenging to make them within the time frame that you have available. Uh, so whilst the samples themselves might run, you, know, you load up the sample in the middle here and it'll run for i don't know two to four hours that sort of thing uh making up these really precise samples in that time window yeah you know, that means you've got that sort of length of time to make up the next sample or well, they tend to go in batches but it's um yeah you tend to basically be working 16 hour days uh 16 18 hour days um for 10 days in a row, uh, which is brutal, especially when you realize that the the, the LLB, this place, um, uh, it's, it's Center Engineering Atomique, uh, which means they're really anal about the security and the such like, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm not showing you any photos of mine here, because um, even though they're shutting down the reactor, they, they, they get really upset about that even though you know most of this stuff is up on their website so that was the first experiment that we did uh second experiment was at bessie which was on something completely different so here what you've got is you're not looking at neutrons anymore so you don't need the nuclear reactor you've just got electrons in this thing called a storage ring which is whizzing around super fast and every now and again, you sort of put them through a magnet or a bender or a wiggler. The benders, wigglers, and undulators are genuinely what they call the magnets. And they give off, they, they make the electrons give off uh, X-rays, 
and then you use those x-rays to study various things. Now in this case, what we were doing is we were using those electrons to zap um, a, a little jet, and then uh, uh, electrons come off that jet, and you put them into one of these things called a photoelectron spectrometer, which I'm going to make you laugh and say that. <laughs> They're not as complicated as they look like. Let's see if we can find a nice, nice up close picture. There we go. Not a, not as complicated as they look. And, and and I'm actually sort of quasi serious there. There, these are cheap ones. That's more like it. So what you've got is your X-rays come through here. They hit a sample, and the electrons are kicked off and. They have a certain amount of energy to them. So in here, you've got a magnet and a detector and how much they're deflected by the their energy is basically their velocity. And so the fast ones aren't bent as much by the magnetic field because they don't have much exposure time to it. And the slower ones are bent much more. It's actually not that different from how the old CRT uh, screens used to work. Uh, apart from you're here, you're using it not to create images, you're using it to measure the ele the energy of the electrons that come off. And so the system that we were looking at uh, was kind of related to the ammonia alkali metal systems. Um, so no one's ever actually measured. Uh, here, I think this is just a ammonia microjet. I mean, still, uh, the the amount of work that went into what seems so trivial and simple. This, is, it's all in pure vacuum here. This is a hand-pulled nozzle. I actually made this. And you've got a barely visible jet of ammonia coming out of there, which then has to be hit by a completely invisible X-ray beam. And then this is the skimmer. Um, so there's actually a fairly decent vapor pressure on this side, which means that the electrons, if, if you're trying to measure the photoelectron spectrum in here, you would get nothing because the, the electrons just get bounced around by all the residual gas that's there. You need a really high vacuum. So there's this little hole, and behind this little hole is a super high vacuum over here. Um, why? Yeah, so you've got super high vacuum over here. And that's where the electrons go through and eventually they hit the magnetic field and they get bent around and you measure the energy of them. And we were doing that with, not just with ammonia solutions, but with ammonia solutions with sodium dissolved in them. Um, or at least that was one of the things. We were also doing pure jets of sodium potassium alloy, which is just one of the most insane systems that even I've ever worked with, you know, because we had like 30 grams which is, uh, if you get that into water, uh, it's a devastating amount of energy that will release. So for me, with a face shield, when it's reacting with water, I reckon about a tenth of a gram is the safe limit. And here we were putting 30 grams in at a time into a vacuum chamber. I mean, there's just so many things that could go wrong. In, in the end, it turned out to be not too bad. We only had one instance where... You know, the nozzle kind of blocked with the sodium potassium alloy, which meant that, you know, when we vented the chamber, we vented it with argon or nitrogen, I forget which, you know, so it doesn't actually react that quickly. However, you've then got to open the vacuum chamber, and when you do that, air gets in. And when sodium potassium alloy gets, um, if it's got a nice clean surface, it'll start to get hot. And it'll get hotter and hotter and hotter till it catches. Yeah, if it gets up to about 60 degrees, it's a runaway thing. It'll just keep getting hotter and hotter and hotter till it catches fire. And you can't see it, but up above here, there is a plastic filter. And above that plastic filter, there would be a plastic tube, which has the 30 grams of sodium potassium alloy in. And if you would have that sort of fire, you know, you, you, you're instantly faced with this problem that uh, there are what, what do I do? The most obvious thing is I just close up the vacuum chamber and suck all the air out, and then it's got all got it all cooled down, and everything will be safe again, right? Well, yeah, that's until you realize that if it's gotten hot enough that it's melted the plastic and you put it under vacuum, it's just going to suck out, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be like a balloon. 
you get the plastic up to about 150 degrees, put it under vacuum, it'll just blow up like a balloon. And then, of course, it'll suck all the air in from a... You can lose control of these systems very quickly. So in the end, we went for the second more obvious solution. You only get a few seconds to work this all out, by the way, um, which is you keep flushing it with with nitrogen. Uh, so we'd filled it up with nitrogen. Enough air had gotten in that it was getting quite warm. So, yeah, you fill it up with nitrogen and, um, yeah, then you've got to wait quite a long time for it to cool down because it can only, it, it'll cool down fairly slowly. Um, and if you get the air back in there while it's still hot, it'll almost instantly go away and catch fire again. So this is one of the real, I mean, lithium fires are absolutely the worst for this. Because if you get lithium burning, it burns at about <laughs> a few thousand degrees. And the only way to put them out, you can't put them out with nitrogen, because it'll react with the nitrogen. You can't put them out. Uh, you, the, the only thing you can put them out with carbon dioxide, they'll react with that too. The only thing you put them out with is by flooding it with argon. And if you flood it with argon, it takes minutes for the stuff to cool down. And if you don't keep up the argon purge for that length of time, uh, yeah, it just instantly catches fire again. So it's almost to the point where the best that you can do with a lithium fire, uh, well, uh, uh, asbestos blanket's not too bad as well. Um, but if they're small scale, uh, you you basically just put a beaker over them and let them burn. And uh, it's almost the safest way I've found dealing with them. Anyway, so that was the the second. Oh, is that nice? Yeah, there we go. So, like I was saying, not really that complicated. X-ray beam comes in here. Actually, X-ray beam comes in from. Actually, no, we look. I've got the wrong geometry. Uh, you're looking down. Um, so the sample would be exactly there. The X-ray beam is coming straight at you. Um, and in this case, the photoelectrons would come up here. So, anyway, uh, so that's what I've been doing for the best part of the last month. And again, yeah, really intensive experiments. I really didn't get much spare time to do anything. Hopefully, from now till Christmas, it'll be a lot more relaxed. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that description of what I've been doing for the last uh, month. And if you did, drop a like in the video and... Uh, Thanks for watching.